Hey there, guys. So today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking this GMK Tech K6 with a Ryzen 7 7840HS, and we're going to be turning this into a Steam console using Bazite. Now, yes, I'm well aware that Valve has announced a new Steam console, but it doesn't really compete with the market segment that this is in because that's using dedicated graphics. This has integrated graphics. Overall, it's a fundamentally different beast, and we still don't even know the price point of the Steam machine. But the specific reason that I want to highlight the GMK Tech K6 is because of the fact that I think it's right now one of the best value mini PCs that you can get if you want to get into that 780M graphics chip. It's still going to be one of the more powerful integrated graphics that you can get without going into a price territory where you're likely going to be considering, without going into a price category where you're likely going to be considering a full-on gaming PC. Now, it's not the cheapest system on the market that has the 780M integrated graphics but it is one of the best values and the reason for that is it comes with 32 gigabytes of RAM and a one terabyte SSD. That 32 gigabytes of RAM kit that is in here currently alone retails for $160 on Amazon. So the fact that this is about $100 more expensive than a system that is rocking the 780M with 16 gigabytes of RAM and a 512 gigabyte SSD and this has 32 gigabytes of RAM and a one terabyte SSD for just an extra $100, that makes this an insane value in comparison to those lower end systems and it really just has to do with that crazy price for RAM right now. The demand for it is so high that currently going with a pre-built or complete package system is a better route than to go down the DIY or the bare bones route. But let's actually take a look at how this performs with Bazite. So immediately jumping in, we're going to be taking a look at a AAA title that is at this point quite a few years old, and that is God of War. Now this is the PC version, but do keep in mind that this is a game that originally launched on the PlayStation 4. And running with the original PlayStation 4 graphics settings, and using FSR at the quality preset, the level of performance that we get here is passable enough for this type of title. Visually speaking, the game doesn't look remarkable, but then again it didn't really re look remarkable on the PlayStation 4 either. And that's about the level of performance that you should expect here. It is going to at least be an above 30 FPS average, but you're not going to be hitting 60. You could potentially get close to getting that 60 FPS average if you're willing to really sacrifice on the quality with FSR, but I just don't think it's worthwhile for this type of game. Still, this should begin to paint a picture to you on the kind of performance that we're going to be getting here. Keep in mind, this is not going to be a better value than a console or anything like that. It's not meant to be. I talked about this in the video that I did talking about the new Steam console, but essentially one of the biggest advantages that consoles have is the fact that they're able to sell the hardware at a cheaper price because they're going to make their money back and then some. The reason that consoles can be so cheap is because of the fact that Microsoft and Sony are going to make their money back and more from selling you software. So a PlayStation 5 can actually end up being a pretty great value overall, at least in comparison to what you can normally get from the PC side of things. And especially because we're talking about a system that is extremely compact here. But but thanks to technology like FSR, this system is going to be able to do pretty well in a lot of PlayStation 4 era titles. The Spider-Man remastered, running at the medium graphics settings, and using FSR with a dynamic resolution scaling targeting a 60 FPS average, is honestly doing a great job here. It's a very playable experience, and while visually it doesn't look remarkable, the playability more than makes up for it. <laughs> There's a good chance that if you just have this hooked up to your TV, you won't even really notice the quality difference. A lot of the times people really overestimate how noticeable resolution is at the distances that you're normally watching your television at. A monitor in a phone can be different scenarios there, but when it comes to your TV, it can be very forgiving for resolution. And that's really what a lot of these types of systems excel at. They're not really meant to be desktop gaming computers, but if you have this as a media console, the fact that you can boot up some games on it and they'll work natively is really impressive. And of course, there's always in-home games game streaming. Though I admit there is a high likelihood that a system like this would just end up being more of a mega bonk machine than anything else for me. And in that scenario, it's a pretty great performer. At 1080p, at the maximum graphic settings, we're getting an above 60 FPS average. It's in the 80s. Even in the most demanding scenarios, the lowest that it would go to is in the high 60s. Really, this is the type of game where if I didn't have the FPS counter there, I wouldn't even be thinking about the level of performance that I'm getting out of it. And that's exactly the 
type of game that I would more find myself playing in a living room because if we're being honest, I'm never going to play a game like Call of Duty or Counter-Strike in a bedroom TV or a living room. But it's very easy to just pick up a controller and hop onto Megabonk and play for about 10 minutes. But I do find myself gravitating towards these types of games nowadays more than anything else really. But I understand that that's more of a me case and not the general trend for everybody. Though indie games are becoming extremely popular and I'm personally a big fan of these survivor type games, you know, things like Megabonk and Vampire Hunters here, which by the way, if you're a fan of Megabonk, you're probably going to enjoy this game. So I would definitely recommend checking it out. It actually existed before Megabonk, but it kind of flew under the radar. I can understand why it's not as fleshed out as Megabonk, but I think that if you enjoy that style of game, you're probably going to have some fun here. But it's also a beautiful performer on a system like this. And this is again, the type of thing where I would very happily just sit there playing this on my TV and have a great time. I don't need to sit there and play some AAA title because a lot of the times I don't really do that anyway. Of course, because it's a Linux system, you can just as easily go onto the Bizarre Packet Manager and install Moonlight. And well, you just add that onto Steam as a non-Steam game and you can pretty much launch it straight from the Steam launcher. So you don't have to go into the desktop mode to do this. And here you can see Spider-Man 2 running beautifully because it's of course running on my gaming PC. And if you saw the Steam presentation, you know that this is something that Valve is really trying to at least put some kind of effort behind. You know, this is of course using Moonlight and Sunshine, so that is a completely different scenario than what Steam would normally function off of, which is the Steam in-home streaming. But the concept is pretty much identical, where you're going to have your central gaming PC and you'd have other devices that seamlessly pair with it so that you can start streaming your games from anywhere, at least as long as you're in the same network. There are ways to set this up to work over the internet, but at that point you're actually dealing with latency and it's going to become a far bigger problem the further you are from wherever it is that your gaming PC is located. You know, sometimes the benefit of using data centers is that data centers could be in a location that might be more ideal for coverage over a wider distance. But in general, the idea behind this is that you're going to be streaming your own games within your own network on any device that you want. And the experience like this is going to be pretty great. But of course, you do have to have a main central computer. But I've always maintained the stance that as of right now, things like the Steam Deck and Steam consoles really work better as companions to an already existing gaming PC. You know, doing something like this, I really wouldn't consider doing it unless we're talking about a scenario where I want to be able to play my games on a living room TV or a bedroom TV. But when it comes to games running natively, you are going to have to stick to older AAA titles and modern indie games. That still gives you a wide library of games that you can play, and there's some absolute classics. I mean, for example, the Mass Effect Legacy Editions run absolutely perfectly on here. Yeah, visually speaking, the games don't look remarkable by today's standards, but it's such an incredible story, such an incredible game series that I would much rather sit here and play this than practically any else on the market right now. So the GMK Tech K6 right now is pretty much one of the best value mini PCs that you can get on Amazon, specifically because of that 32 gigabytes of RAM and one terabyte SSD. But unfortunately, prices have been trending up in general for mini PCs. So this is honestly not an incredible price in terms of the history of systems that have been rocking this chip. But as of 2025, right now, this is pretty much one of the cheapest ways to get into mini PCs that are in that higher tier of performance. So if you've been looking to get one of these systems, this is pretty much the way to go about it. You're going to have to go with a full kit. Right now is not the time to go bare bones. So check it out down below, but I'll catch you guys in the next one.